All right, we are talking Green Bay Packers football on Prime Sports Network, and uh, we just concluded our condensed uh, video where uh, we talked Green Bay Packers football regarding the top three draft needs. You can check that out over on Our Lads Football uh, Network YouTube channel. We'll have a link in the description of this video uh, as usual. Uh, and uh, just like we did in the other video, we welcomed in a new Green Bay Packer uh, analyst, uh, and hopefully he'll uh, be with us for uh, longer than just this one interview. Uh, Ryan Schlepp is the host of Packernet Podcast, and uh, Ryan, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. It's a good time as always. Talk a little bit about uh, Packernet Podcast. How long has that been around for? I think 2017 was my first year. Um, that was the year Rodgers went down. He missed the entire year. The next year, 2018, the Packers completely fell apart. Oh. And in 2019, I said, if if this team misses the playoffs again, I'm done. I'm, I have cursed this team, and I apologize. Fortunately, they turned it around. So, yeah, it's been, uh, I don't know, seven-ish, eight-ish years. I don't even know anymore. It, it just kind of flies by. But it does. things have been going for a long time, and I started doing daily several years ago. So we've got quite a collection of podcasts out there right now okay and then it's uh, now it, we know it's on youtube uh it, where else it streams on all the other platforms yeah so um youtube I'm, I'm trying to be more diligent with getting the uh the videos up on youtube but there is a uh, a daily actual podcast so if you have a you know itunes or whatever podcast player you have packernet's on there it's it's actually multiple i i do i try to do twice daily on there i've got a call-in show as well as my my daily about 45 minute long packers just talk show whatever Cool. And then there's also, it's uh, expanded to the Packers Podcast Network. We've got a couple other uh, guys on there that do shows. So it's it's uh, you're not going to be missing content if you're right. <laughs> looking for some Packers content. Sounds like we came to the right person, <laughs> right, the right Packer analyst. All right. So, Ryan, let's talk first of all. I'll tell you what. Well, uh, how's, how's the draft capital for the Packers? It's pretty fantastic. I, I, I don't remember exactly what I think they're about the fourth highest when you look at the trade value charts and put it all together, which is pretty impressive when you're picking 25. But uh, Brian Gutekunst, he's he's cut from uh, cut from the same mold as a lot of these other Packer guys. They love their their draft picks. And so yeah. he stacks the picks and you're always surprised every year. It's been three years in a row. They've had 11 picks. So it's been pretty staggering. That they've been able to pull that off, and uh, so yeah, they've they've got obviously the additional second round pick from the Rodgers trade. They've got an additional third round pick from uh, trading Razul Douglas to the Bills. They always have a couple sixth round or seventh round picks. So yeah, I think we're sitting with eleven picks right now. Okay, and yeah, because I'm looking over the you can see here just alone the aqua the players that are in aqua on the. Our lads depth charts are the new players from free agency. True. And look at here. There's one Josh Jacobs on offense and then <laughs> defense is two uh, McKinney and green. That is it. Yep. So a lot of homegrown talent. Yeah. And that's exactly along the lines of what you're talking about. So, all right, uh, let's, you know what? I want to start on defense and I sure. want to start on defense because uh, this is the big story as far as uh, I could see. Uh, with Jeff Halfley coming in, which mm. is a big surprise uh, following uh, college football as much as it do the NFL. And because um, it looked like there was even some time this year early in the season, I'm sure there were a lot of BC fans that were thinking, ah, oh, it's enough of Halfley. We lost to another crappy team right. uh, early in the season and it's enough of this. And then all of a sudden he gets the team, well, not all of a sudden, but you know, he has a good season, gets to the ball, uh, wins a ball game. And then, uh, and then he's out. So wait, yeah. what? And then he leaves. <laughs> so that was a big surprise. But uh, the biggest news take on this, uh, of course, is what's going on with the fact that the Packers have been playing a 3-4 defense since 2008. Yeah. And now they are going to transition to Halfley's 4-3 defense. And what I think I, I, is most important, too, is, is the fact that Halfley is going to be a lot more aggressive, mm -hmm. whether it's press man or just the overall aggressive nature of his defense than his predecessor, Joe Barry. So lots of changes on the Green Bay Packer defense, especially scheme wise or most importantly, scheme wise. Yeah, I mean the, the switch to a four three is is a shock to the system. He said since Dom Capers got in here, it's been three four, um, and you know that was kind of a big change at the time. And I, I just I haven't been acclimated to a four three. I've been partial to it just because that's what we've always had. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how it operates. I mean the way I think about defense has always been three four. So I've I've got to kind of 
step back and learn a little bit about about the four three defense and how that all works. As far as the aggression, I'm very excited about it. I mean, you can't get less aggressive, I think, than Joe Barry. Um, but at the same time, we've had a lot of problems with defense in Green Bay, and we've had a lot of lip service from defensive coordinators coming in, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, Patton was supposed to be aggressive, and then Joe Barry's going to bring a new energy. And there's always this hype that comes in, and it, it's kind of gotten to the point now um, – going from Capers to Petten to Barry and now Halfley to where it's like, you know, all the words are great. We need to see it on the football field. Yeah. So um, I do think aggression is what they need. I think they're too talented. Uh, I mean, you know, you look at the draft capital that was put into this team. It doesn't make sense to have such a passive, uh, you know, scheme-based system. These guys are talented football players. You got to cut them loose and let them go play. So I'm hoping that this will end up being a benefit. I do think that they have the pieces. You know, there's some concern about can these guys play off the edge. I think so. Rashawn Gary is familiar with a 4-3. Lucas Van Ness is familiar with a 4-3. So I don't think there's going to be any real hiccups there. So hopefully it's a relatively smooth transition. Yeah, I'm a Michigan fan. And uh, I'll say this. When when Rashad, when when Rashad Gary was being transitioned to the 3-4, I was like, really? He could do yeah. that? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Rashad Gary knows how to – uh how to play a three uh, the role of a four three defensive sure. no question um okay but anyway the fact is is that there are going to be a lot of uh, scheme changes here but with only one new impact player so far draft is coming that xavier mckinney mm -hmm. um how big was that for this defense i think it was huge i mean uh i mean first of all you have to have a guy that can do it you know if you're going to be playing more middle field close more single high safety You've got to have the talent to do it. And I, I kind of wondered if they were going to uh, stick with Darnell Savage. I know he hasn't been a very good safety to begin with, but it kind of seemed like his play really dipped once Joe Barry showed up. And I thought, you know, he's got the range. Maybe they're going to go with it. But they uh, they never really gave it a second thought. They were obviously just pretty much done with him. So, um, But, you know, I mean, there's only – I don't want to sound biased, but I said it on my show. There's really only two kind of premier guys when you look at really talented and still really young – and it's Josh Jacobs and Xavier McKinney. And, of course, the Packers being the Packers, they hate free agency. But if you can get a 24, 25-year-old, they're all about it. So um, they they obviously went out and got – I was kind of surprised that they ended up picking up both of them. Um, Xavier McKinney, obviously, he came from the um, uh, Wink Martindale, which is somewhat similar. It's very aggressive. It's uh, I think it's a lot more single high than what even we're going to be doing, but he has the familiarity with it. So hopefully he can come over and and just kind of be that enforcer, you know, on the deep middle of the field and and kind of take some of the pressure off. But I, again, I think I think not being super familiar with this style of defense, that um, this is kind of a critical piece that you have to be able to have a guy that can handle that responsibility of being the deep middle guy. Yeah, because right now we talked about this on the other video is the fact that he's lined up uh, with a seventh round draft pick from last right. year, Anthony Johnson Jr. Um, who uh, I think he got in on a little over 300 snaps and any rookie is going to have trouble. And uh, Anthony sure. definitely had his, his share, but that's why, as we said in the other video, um, not just free safety, but corner. And that means outside and at nickel, yep. this is definitely the spot that's going to have a lot of new faces on it following the draft. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I always think you try to go into the draft not being um, stuck in a corner. You know, you want to be able to, to freely draft the best player available. Yep. And if you go into a situation where we can't not draft a safety or whatever the case may be, um, you, you find yourself in a bind where you're trading up where you feel like you don't have to or you're panic drafting or whatever. So I think this was a good opportunity to at least say, you know, if, if this is all we get, then this is all we get. You know, we'll, we'll deal with Stokes and Jair and, and Xavier and Anthony Johnson. But I don't think if we got if we didn't get Xavier, we would have been in a lot of trouble. So there's still a lot of work to do. Like I said, Anthony Johnson, there was a lot of hope about him. A lot of the, the draft analysts were saying this guy for sure can come in and play somewhere. That didn't materialize as a rookie. Um, but I, I think they can manage but like I said in the last video, I think the, the biggest gap between where they are and where they could potentially be is still in the secondary. Yeah, so Stokes, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting because two of the players that you talked about, uh, offensive line and here in the secondary, both of these guys were drafted in that 21 class. So uh, that's 21 class not looking too good, at least those first couple of picks. But Stokes, you think that's pretty much it now that – He's going to play this year. 
Uh, they're going to hope for the best, but chances are, if it hasn't happened already, it's probably not going to happen. But let's also preface the fact that Halfley, defensive backs coach, <laughs> yeah, that's his specialty. And maybe if uh, if anything, if anybody might be able to get something out of Stokes, who knows? Maybe it's Halfley. Well, and I've been pumping the brakes on a lot. I mean, a lot of fans are they're all for blood with Stokes. I I, I don't. I've I've pled my case a hundred times. They don't want to hear it. But you know, my my whole thing was he was a a decent rookie for a rookie, right? He wasn't a great foot, but for a rookie, I mean, it was a good performance. Okay. And then they want to kill him because the next two years are bad. But the next year he got hurt, so that that didn't really tell me anything. And then the year after that, he he didn't play. He didn't come back until late in the season. And by that point, he, he had played like one game and he was terrible. But it's like, well, duh, he hasn't played in a year. He comes get thrown in in the middle of the season. He has a bad game. So everybody's just, they're just sick of it. But I, my thought is, give him an opportunity to go through training camp with, as you said, Jeff Halfley. Get the, you know, be with everybody else and train with everybody else. Start week one. And I want to see what he can do by week six, week eight, week 10. Um, and if he can't do it, if uh, well, first of all, he has to be healthy. You can't be out three years and expect to get another contract. Even if you have potential, you're done. But if you if you play and you get the full year and it's not it, then fine, we move on. But I just want to see it. I want to see him play a full year and fail before I'm willing to give up on the guy. But, you. you know, again, has it been there? No. And this is his final opportunity, even if it's not necessarily his fault for getting hurt. I mean, you, you got to produce at some point. So you think that if they draft, well, when they draft a corner... Do you think that corner then is probably going to have experience both inside and out? This way, you've got that option in case Stokes does uh, turn the corner and you bring him back in 2025. Um, it, it certainly wouldn't hurt. And obviously, you know, you can point to a guy like Cooper DeGene that possibly could pull that off. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah but um, at the same time, I also feel like, you know, why be cute with it? If, you, if you've got a true lockdown outside guy... Just, just get him. You know. What are you thinking about? Right well, now, I, I personally, I, I really like Kool Aid McKinstry. I, um, I'm just a big fan of his, and maybe it's just because he's one of the guys that I think could make it. Um, we'll see. To 25, I mean, but um, I, I really like him, and I think he's a good football player. I, I don't think he's going to be an inside guy. I, I could be wrong about that. Maybe he could pull that off. Um, I mean, it's kind of kind of interesting. I've been battling against this, but Jair was thought of as being sort of a slot guy at one point. The way I see it, worst case scenario, let's say you do get Kool Aid McKinstry and Eric Stokes are both really good outside guys. I mean, in that case, if if you're gonna pull my arm, fine, put Jair yeah. in the slot. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, yeah. I, there are worse things that could happen. All right. So, uh, and overall, give me a number. How many impact uh, draft picks do you think they'll make in the secondary? Two or three? Um. Are we just talking picks? How many yeah. they're going to make? Yeah, how many? And again, impact. I mean, think? you think uh, it could be two of the top five picks? Sure. Three of the top Let me, seven. Uh, so they've got, I just want to see how many we have in the top 100. There's one, two, three, four, five picks in the top 100. Um, I'll, I'll, I would say there's a decent chance that there is... Um, I, I want to say two, but that might be too many. There, there's definitely really? going to be one in the top 100. Okay. And then probably, I would I would guess three by the time the draft is done with all 11 picks. Okay, but it could just be one, which, which and we just started, so that's, that's for the secondary. And by the way, Green is somebody that I know he was just picked up and he was a rookie last year, it didn't do much. But Green, again, Michigan fan, Green was a good college football player. So um, I, I'm interested to see whether or not... Uh, he uh, has a good camp. Um, sure. And hey, they had two seventh rounders perform for him last year. So well, it's funny because I always write off whenever these moves happen. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, they picked up a guy, whatever. Yeah. But every year, somebody like that does end up having right. a good season. So I, I keep right. telling myself, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> stop doing that. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So uh, let's go uh, to the front seven and um, up front again, especially if this goes more to a four three, um, the edge. Does it look pretty good? Because it does to me on paper. Um, do you think they need to need to add just because anytime you're going to run a four three, you definitely want to have a, a three impact if not a fourth. But do you think they have the necessary guys on the edge right now? 
I think they're okay. I wouldn't be shocked. Like, if they went first-round edge, I think a lot of people would be upset. I would understand it. Um, I mean, you got Gary, who you just paid. You got Lucas Van Ness. I don't think Preston is a massively long-term option. He'll be around okay. for a, a couple years. Wow. Um, and I don't know about Enigbare. Um, he's, he's, you know, okay as sort of a backup, but also I don't know what happens when we switch to a 4-3. I can't say that he's one of those guys that can make that That's switch. True. Yeah. So I'm looking at three that I like. And and by the way, Preston, I have no idea how good he's going to be with his hand in the dirt. That's I really don't. I, I had assumed that he had done a decent amount of that, at least in nickel or something, and I went and looked. He really hasn't done very much at all. Yep. So, um, I, I again, it, it doesn't feel like a huge need, but if they went and got at least... I mean, I'm, I'm guessing at some point they're going to do it. I don't know how early. And sure. um, again, even if it's round one, especially given how much of a premium it is, and I know how Gutekunst likes, first of all, defense, second of all, premier positions like Edge. I mean, look at Rashawn and Lucas Van Ness. It just it wouldn't s massively shock me if if an early first or second round edge was taken. Well, and 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 I think the bonus too is that both Brooks and Wooden. Sure. Um, are That's capable. another big question. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I know uh, Brooks actually could play pretty much anywhere, um, but uh, it does look like they've got good enough depth. So we'll see. We'll find out in the draft. Okay. Sure. So inside. Uh, you know, Kenny Clark, another player that could play just about anywhere, such a very talented player. Um, and then Wyatt, uh, you know, that, that, that just, again, just looking at the depth chart, yeah. uh, that looks <laughs> awfully strong, but you know, Wyatt was a rookie, uh, uh, two years, uh, now, uh, hasn't taken off yet. Uh, how do you feel that he's played so far? So I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Wyatt because of I, I'm okay with a guy that's a really good pass rusher and kind of abysmal as a run defender. And that's kind of where he's at. Okay. Um, he's, I mean, really pretty top shelf. And and I also kind of feel like with this four, three defense, you know, to kind of come in and just be that pure penetrator, I think that that's going to work to his benefit. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see what he's going to be able to do again. He really struggles as a run defender and I know you need to be more well-rounded, but again, with the way the NFL is, I, I, I wouldn't trade them for anybody else. If you can be, you know, a, a, a top pass rusher, just go be it. I, you know, it's fine. We'll figure out the rest. Um, as far as you know, the rest of the guys, you know, again, the the biggest question for me is exactly what you said with Brooks and Wooden. Um, if they're staying inside, I think we're good. But there is a question: Would you want to kick them to the outside because yeah. they were edge rushers that got kicked inside? which makes sense in a 3-4, but now that we're 4-3, maybe one, if not both, could be at least considered on the outside. So if that's the case, then edge is less of a concern, but then you got to start wondering about maybe depth on the inside. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out too. All right, linebacker, and of course Walker, uh, he's the, the, the linchpin there, and uh, he seems to have had a very volatile career sure. so far. Uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think Walker is what he is, or do you think there's another gear that he can get to? That's kind of what we're hoping for. I mean, you can see the athletic potential, but it just it hasn't necessarily materialized. My biggest frustration, and I, I put this on Joe Barry, although I don't know, is the way that our linebackers played were so hesitant. They 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 sat and waited. And, you know, you, you, Joe Barry being a passive guy, he doesn't yep. want to get beat. You don't want to be right. aggressive, and then they beat you. So it's kind of sit and wait. I, I do wonder in this defense if he's going to be cut loose a little bit more and given some freedom to kind of just attack a little bit. Um, and if the, if so, if that'll end up helping. But, I you know, obviously I don't think he's lived up to the first round billing up to this point. Um, even the, you know, temper tantrums inside the play just hasn't quite been what we need it to be. I think Isaiah McDuffie is the exact opposite, though, for a six-round pick. Um, he's actually been a pretty solid football player. I think he's okay. probably our... our at least last year was probably our best run defender on the team. And uh, again, with the four, three, I'm hoping that we can obviously we play nickel a lot, but you know, with the weak, strong and, and Mike linebackers, maybe you can kind of put these guys into more defined roles and allow them to kind of uh, flourish in what they do best. Yeah. With, uh, with, with the switch, even, well, even though there's the switch, uh, the fact is, is that uh, Campbell uh, was cut so mm -hmm. th is that a situation where you think that they're going to look for someone uh, to play the strong side? Because uh, right now, if, if again, how often they'll use it. 
But the fact is, is that that seems like there's an opening right there. Yeah, we'll we'll see. It's kind of one of the things I'm curious about is is where they decide to put these guys. But <laughs> yeah, um, we all my, are, my, right? My, yeah. my biggest concern, honestly, is just the draft class. I mean, it's really not very strong with linebackers this year. Yep. Um, so we'll see if, if they like somebody that happens to fall into their lap. They wouldn't be afraid to do it. Okay. But otherwise, I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be Quay, McDuffie, and Eric Wilson. Wilson does have some uh, playing experience, especially with Minnesota as a, as a part-time starter or whatever. Uh, mostly a special teamer, but I think it's kind of worst-case scenario. That would be the lineup. Do you think that uh, the team can use another like late round addition that knows somebody, you know, big guy can replace Layton? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I do kind of wonder if they're going to be looking at that. Um, I, I don't know if you want to go to the full reaches of Tavondre sweat. I've kind of uh, not been a big fan of him, but you're, you're right. Somebody that is sort of the, uh, the, the bigger side, the one technique yeah. or whatever. Um, that can come in and do that. I, I do think, you know, Packer fans really like TJ Slayton and I okay. haven't quite figured out exactly why, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's kind of a fan favorite, but I, I do agree. I think it's time to, you know, find another option um, because I do think Kenny Clark and Devonte Wyatt would be better just moving forward. And Slayton, I don't know that he's done a very good job just kind of holding down and being that guy that can kind of be your run support. So it would be nice to find someone that can come in and replace him. Uh, savvy. not Jonathan Ford, by the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Ford, so Rudy is still a free agent, mm -hmm. uh, before we move over to the offensive side, any chance he'll be back? I liked Rudy Ford. I really did. Um, and you know, he's, he's kind of a heat seeking missile type of guy. He'd like to come up, you know, he's a special teamer, you know, who come full speed and just lay somebody out. I thought maybe sounds that like would a Halfley be a, kind of guy. Yeah. It, it sounded like a good Halfley guy. I thought it'd be a good compliment with kind of being more of a box guy next to Xavier, but, um, Packers don't seem massively interested. I can't imagine there's a, a big market or a, a high price tag. So I, I get the impression they're just wanting to move in a different direction. So I don't always understand the reasons behind it, but I do get the impression that that's not going to be an option. Okay. To move over to offense, and on the offensive side, I tell you what, let's talk about the other player that's still out there. And and it's so interesting because I, I go through all the teams and have all the interviews, and we're, I'm at like the last stage of interviews. And I, this is the first time I've seen a team with this least amount oh, of free agents, and with nobody left on even on uh, in, in, as far as their restricted their unrestricted free agents class. It's like, yep. It's it's nobody's there. So uh, <laughs> one guy that is is Bakhtiari. So now I wonder uh, whether or not because I'm a Jet fan. So I wonder whether and again this is just me guessing. Is that uh, is he waiting for the Jets draft to find out if they get a tackle and if they do, all right, I'll go I'll, I'll go do something else because there's no way the Jets want me now. Or if they don't find their tackle, they're going to have an opening there. Maybe I could go to the Jets. Uh, or do you think that has nothing to do with anything and that uh, Bick Thierry will find his way back with the Packers? Um, I will go with neither. Uh, I don't oh. think he's coming back. I don't think he'll be a Packer again. I think that's that course that's run its course. Um, I think the Packers are ready to to move on. I, I thought it was a done deal with the Jets at one point, but I was reminded of the fact that he is unbelievably vocal in um this movement away from the exact turf that hurt Aaron Rodgers. Oh. He's been extremely vocal about football players should not be subject to this. It's terrible. The NFL is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think he would ever play okay. on a on a field like that. Um based on his comments. It would be really shocking for him to to go ahead and do something like that, especially with Rodgers getting hurt. So uh, I don't know what's what's going to happen with him. Um, you know, it's it's one of those situations, uh, potentially similar to Aaron Jones, where you feel like there's maybe a little bit bigger market than than there actually is. I mean, his knee is a serious serious problem. Um, even after it was repaired, it needed to be re repaired, and it it just kept flaring up. They couldn't get it under control. His his age is becoming a problem. I mean, there's no question that you know when he's healthy, when he's playing, he's a good football player. I just think yeah. his knee is. I I I just think it's kind of cooked. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe he just uh, is one of those players that just decides to hang around during the season and yeah. wait. Yep, um, absolutely. Because yeah, I, I'm sure with his health issues, he doesn't need to go through camp, and he doesn't need to go through right. all that other 
Uh, probably doesn't want to. Probably doesn't <laughs> if he want could avoid it. it, he'd rather just wait. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, somebody gets hurt. Okay. I'm here. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. He's only had 25 starts in the last four years combined. Yeah. Okay. So uh, speaking of Aaron Jones, uh, and I was kind of rooting for the Packers uh, last year because, uh, first of all, I've always been kind of a Packer fan when I was young. Now, I were my favorite team, but I was rooted for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, recently, uh, I, I, we had our first uh, draft for our new uh, uh, Dynasty League. And I I had the, the last pick of the first round, which is pretty bad when you're <laughs> – when you have a quarterback situation where everybody wants the quarterbacks, but at the spot I was in, I was like, well, the only way I could do this, I got to go after one of the rookies or maybe I should just wait. And so I decided to wait and, uh, and I wound up picking uh, Jordan love and uh, also Baker Mayfield. Okay. And by the way, I also picked Aaron Rodgers late. Uh, (laughs) That didn't work out obviously. (laughs) <laughs> but the point is, is that I was high on Jordan Love as well. I really felt that he was a nice pickup where I got him because I, I really felt that I could kind of, I mean, the Packers organization, they, they just, from the outsider's perspective, they always seem to know what they're doing with these guys, the, the patient approach, and it seems to work. And they've got this charm quarterback deal going there. And so when Jordan Love had his up and, ups and downs last year, it was no surprise. But once he got going, yep. it was a beautiful thing. And I was so, um, uh, I, I felt for Packers fans in the San Francisco game because they outplayed the Niners in that game. Yeah, and I thought they should have won that game. Uh, I'm sure you guys felt they should have won the game. Um, but the other thing was was watching uh, the performance once again from Aaron Jones for the last time, and how much he meant to that organization. Mm-hmm. I mean, when he was healthy at the end of the season, that's what really with Jordan Love playing great. Now with Jones running the football, it was like, wow, is this team good right now? And they're doing it without Christian Watson. So um, my point, I guess I wanted to make as we talk about running back and the Josh Jacobs move is that this is just all about getting younger, right? Because yep. Jones is just, I got I have to believe that the fans in green Bay are going to miss him greatly. Oh yeah. It's hard to think of a Packer that has endeared himself more to, uh, to the fans than Aaron Jones. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of just good human beings when you think about Bart Starr and, and people like that that are just as wholesome as they come. Um, and, and Aaron Jones has to be near the top of that list. I mean, just a wow. great human being and um, the things he did and the way he carried himself and everything else. Um, you know, he, shortly before he was let go, even, the, you know, the, the GM and everybody else went so far as to say, you know, he's the heart and soul of our locker room. And, you know, that, 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 uh, didn't surprise anybody to hear those kinds of comments, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, the Packers are very rigid in their approach, and um, you know, obviously, it's rubbed people like Rodgers and a few other people the wrong way. But at the bottom line, um, they they're very protective of their salary cap, and they love draft and develop. And if they have an opportunity to get a very talented, very young guy like Josh Jacobs, and just sort of reset the clock yep. at running back, yep. they're going to do it. And so yep. they they did offer Aaron Jones a contract for what they felt he was worth. Aaron Jones um, felt that that was somewhat offensive and, and didn't want that contract. And so they just parted ways. But, you know, as much as I like Aaron Jones, I, I and maybe it's just because I'm a, you know, sort of a Ted Thompsonite at heart. Um, I, I, I love the move because it just makes sense to me. Oh, yeah. I, I just, I, I think especially with such a young team. I mean, this is a team that can that can work together for the next five, six years from Josh Jacobs, Watson, Dobbs, Reed. I mean, just go down the line, Rasheed Walker, Elton Jenkins, I mean, Zach Tom, Luke Musgrave, yes. uh, Jordan Love. I mean, th- this is this crew is going to be together. And, yeah. and I think that that's such a rare and cool thing to be able to do. And if we can do it, as I said, at running back, do it. Yeah, when you're young, and I'm sure there are a lot of young Packer fans out there that don't want to hear what we're saying – because I was there as well, but you yeah. get to a point when you realize that it is a business um, at, at, at some point. And for most of the, of course, for the general managers, it is a business, but for us fans, we have to understand the business part of it. And this is it. The really smart organizations do yeah. it this way. Right. This, they're not, they're not being negative. They're not being, uh, you know, uh, all the, they're, 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 they're heartless. It's not about that. Uh, right. it, it's about, you have to be smart. And the Packers are being very smart. 
Um, okay, AJ Dillon. So do you think Dillon is one of those guys that'll just be with the Packers for a while still? Or uh is is his is he on a short leash? Very. Um he was I, I believe he was even out the door at one point when free agency started. And um, you know, so both of our running backs were gone. Kind of all we all assumed Aaron Jones would be coming back, and instead it was AJ Dillon that came back. And uh, it was for a very, very low contract. So it's it's one of those, you know, w listen, if you want to come back, it's on the minimum. Okay. And we're going to do it for a year and we'll see how it goes. But, you know, with Josh Jacobs at the forefront, I mean, Emmanuel Wilson looked promising, e even as so far as can you, you know, it's one of those things where when someone's gunning for you and you're, you're not, you're struggling. If Emmanuel Wilson can do what A.J. Dillon can do, that's a problem, yeah. you know. So and then on top of that, I would not be surprised if the Packers take a swing at running back. Um, so, you know, Dylan is in a tenuous spot and he's, he's similar to, you know, some other guys where he's going to have to show something because he's going to be a free agent again. And if there's no reason to give him a bigger contract, they're just going to let guys like Emmanuel Wilson and whoever else run the show. Cause they're perfect, especially with Josh Jacobs at the helm and they drafted right. Josh Jacobs to be a guy that can take more on as a, as a feature back. Aaron Jones had to be protected. You know, they could only give him 10, 12 carries, and then they wanted to shelf him because he can't carry a workload. They specifically got Josh Jacobs because he can handle a workload, which means Dylan has less to do and less use to the team. That's so, yeah, he's he's got it coming from all sides. He's really got to do something special this year. So it's interesting. The Packers look like they're in a situation then at running back where, hey, you know what, if they don't add anybody okay but with all those picks uh they sh they probably will add someone at some point yeah. just to see if you know take a flyer on someone uh because the two guys that they have on and you mentioned wilson uh who uh got some snaps last year but even the other kid merriweather i mean this is a kid who actually had a very good career at you know for a pretty bad college uh sure. so uh, i'm always intrigued to see how those kids look uh, when they're now playing uh, with the big boys. So, yeah, I'm going to see how uh, Ellis Merriweather uh, looks this camp. No. I wouldn't be surprised if they added into the player, like you said. Okay. Uh, tight end. Now, it looks like they're in really great shape at 1-2. Um, do they like Sims as a 3? Or they get or, or I don't know what their situation is with Davis, but who is the 3? Is it Davis or Sims? They actually really like Davis. Davis and it was, it was kind of a, it was a weird thing because um, – initially Tyler Davis was really bad and you could just tell the team liked him. They kept pushing him out there and it's like, what are you doing? Why do you keep doing that? But eventually he did kind of hit a little bit of a stride. And now that we got Musgrave and Kraft in front of him, it's not a bad situation. So yeah, I think it's going to be Tucker Kraft, Luke Musgrave and the coach's favorite Tyler Davis at three. So you think they're fine there then? They're, they're probably not even going to add a tight end in the draft. I mean, there is some talk, you know, with, uh, um, this is where I was talking about, uh, having the thing up, everybody's name it, it escapes me. A tight end that just recently left that I was a bit, DeGuara, that I was oh, yeah. uh, hopeful for that was that was going to become a thing. He's sort of the H-back type guys. Um, there, it, bottom line is there's some talk. Uh, you look at guys in the draft like uh, Sinet or Sinat, however you say his name. Um, I, I forget Kids exactly. Kansas State. Yes, that's what yep. it is. He kind of fits that. So so there's some talk about maybe mid to late round. You see that sort of okay. H-back guy. You can maybe take a flyer at him. Um, but again, I, I do think, you know, you just got Tucker and Kraft. They like yeah. Tyler Davis. They have Ben Sims. Um, if it's best player available, fine. But I, I have to assume from their standpoint, they're set. Okay. Uh, wide receiver. And it's it's amazing what this room looked like last year, <laughs> right. uh, but it worked out, and that is incredible. And it's just uh, it was great to see. And uh, so Watson is the most intriguing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the kid is. I mean, I, I I did pick him on my fantasy team last year, so boy, it could have been so much better last year if you would have stayed healthy. <laughs> but uh, Packers fans know that. So again, it's about keeping him healthy is big, um, but. Uh, you could see the R behind me. That's mm -hmm. Rutgers. Yep. Yep. So I know about Bo Melton. Sure. And I was actually surprised that he did not. First of all, I was surprised he got drafted so late. Then I was surprised that he didn't get anywhere with Seattle. So <laughs> when he finally started to make an impact last year, I was like, well, where has this been? Because sure. I knew how exciting a player he was at a Big Ten school and uh, throw in Wicks 
who was fifth round pick from last year. Of course, Reed was also a high draft pick. And uh, it looks like to me that those at least those top five guys uh, look, and again, as long as Melton picks up where he left off, this is as good and as, as, as a young unit there is in the NFL. Probably the, 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 the most talented, youngest yeah. unit in the NFL. Well, it, and it's tough because we've seen so few glimpses. You know, nobody's been able to take the reins and be like a number one. They, they've shared things, plus Watson, you know, with the injuries. Dobbs yeah. was injured. Watson was injured. Some of the guys were uh, uh, um, uh, rookies, plus Wicks. You know, they, they didn't know what they had with Bo Melton and Dontavian Wicks until a little bit later. So it's kind of a... You know, they should have played him earlier, but they didn't. So I, I couldn't even tell you what exactly we have. Jaden Reed was sort of that top guy last year, surprisingly. I think he kind of took all of us by surprise a little bit. And um, I think there's a cat in my office. I'm sorry about that. I didn't, oh, that didn't know he office? was in here. I was like, is that you or is that me? That could be um, my cat. Is it? I don't know. Let me see. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's one of our cats. <laughs> <laughs> Jaden Reed... Um, so, so he was kind of the top guy, but that's because Watson was injured. And, and, you know, again, you know, there are Packer fans who think Watson needs to go, which obviously is, is absurd, but it's like, it's just funny because, you know, you know, they, they go in, 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 uh, you know, little periods of time, Watson is the main guy and it's amazing. And then Dobbs is your main guy. And then Reed is that guy and then Wick. So it's, it's just, we haven't had enough time to see what we have, but, um, it is very exciting and it, it makes it hard for the draft because you don't want to say we don't need a wide receiver, but at the same time, you look at it and say, if we don't get sort of a, a true number one, you're kind of just throwing another guy in the mix because I, I genuinely think we've got a bunch of guys that you could consider pretty decent number twos. And if you're throwing another number two in there, I mean, you can do it. I don't necessarily fully understand the point of it. I hear what you're saying, um, but you know what? I actually think... Watson could be a one. I really oh, uh, do. absolutely. I, I think a couple guys could be for sure. And that, yeah. that again, that makes it harder because now even if you get a number one, you know, you, you maybe already have one. So, well, you know. I think at this point, uh, they've done, to, for, again, from my perspective, I mean, do they really need another wide receiver? I oh, mean, I, come on. A hundred percent. I'm just saying it's, it's a, it's hard because you always want to say best player available and you never want to rule out, you never want to rule out a position, but you look at wide receiver and it's like, I don't get it, man. I mean, unless you're getting Marvin Harrison or something at picking 25, I'd rather we just don't touch it. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. So who do you think, uh, besides Watson, um, who do you, and it seems like it's Reed. The, the, yeah, the, that seems to be the consensus of if if Watson is not the number one guy, Reed would be the guy. Yeah, and Re Reed is pretty well relegated to the slot. So I mean, if you've got three guys out there, and that's kind of the hard part. It kind of as weird as it sounds, it kind of feels to me right now that it's Watson, Reed, and Wicks would be sort of the three guys. Wicks was a a real heck of a revelation. I mean, we were shocked to see Romeo Dobbs kind of emerge as a fourth round pick and and see what he was able to do. You don't expect much from a fourth round pick. But to get I was Wicks a big fan by Dobbs, though. I, I followed okay. him because I know it's hard were... to because he's out west. He's yep. playing for he's not playing for a Pac-12 school. Um, but I really liked uh, um, when I got an opportunity to see him play because I watched a lot of college football. I was like, yeah, this kid's going to be a good player. Um, so yeah, I know I know a lot of people were surprised, but yeah, yeah I think the kid's the real deal. And there and there were several, but I you know again that's me sort of with my draft bias. Like you know, there's always people saying he's going to be good. Trust me, and it's like okay, well he's a fourth round pick. Let's temper yeah. our expectations. But but again, to then have Wicks, who was a fifth round pick, kind of emerge and be better than Dobbs and better than you know a lot of these guys that we have, especially as kind of more of that X role. You know, just a really good route runner and whatnot, and good hands and good, uh, you know, fighting through contact and you know breaking tackles. Uh, it, it's one of those things that I, I just don't want to believe it. You know, it's, it's, I mean, I, of course I want to believe it, but you, you see it and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that can continue. And then he does it again and again and again. So, you know, I, again, th these guys have had so little time and, and, you know, everything was just all over the place. You know, they didn't know what they had in half of these guys. Matt LaFleur keeps, you know, he's, he, he doesn't know what he has. You know, he's trying to figure out how to use these guys and, you know, again, once they figured out what they had in Wicks, they started using them more. They started using Bo Melton more. Another guy that I said, eh, I don't believe it. And then it just kept happening. Um, so, and then, of, of course, you had, we'll get to the tight ends, but they started to emerge and started getting used more. So, 
e- even sitting here, I'm excited, but I have to assume some guys are going to emerge. Some maybe will kind of level off. I don't know where these guys are going to end up, but but I'm certainly excited about it. I think the five guys, I think they're all the real deal. And it's just a matter of, again, you got to keep away from all the usuals, the injuries, things sure. of that nature. And look, we just talked about the Paul Melton thing. It's like, well, was that what we saw last year? Was it, I would say if there's any questions, it might be him because – it's like, well, where was it before? It should have been there before. Maybe it was just something and he caught fire. And then now he's really not that guy. Um, but other than that, because I do think he's that guy, mm-hmm. um, you would think that the league is filled with really good receivers because the league has gone all passing lately. But that's yeah. just not the case. There's, there, 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 you know, look at this, such a great draft class for receivers. We're, we're talking all about that. And then so many teams are, are, are so excited about getting their hands on all these receivers, this draft. Um, but the Packers are in such great shape because they have five of them already that they could turn to and say, hey, you know, all these guys could be a part of our future. And even that kid, Tere, I remember mm-hmm. uh, scouting him. Um, and he had such a great FCS career before yeah. making the transition to Nebraska. And it was like, wow, this could have got, this guy could be an interesting late round draft pick. And uh, he's still on the team as well. Um, do you think, uh, so from Heath, Pitts, DuBose, Ture, uh, who would be the, 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 the guy that, if there was only six on the team, who would be the sixth? Probably Samori Ture, just because he's a known commodity. But at the same time, that could work against him. Um, if if the team feels like they they know what they've got in them and they want to try to maybe see what maybe for example Grant Debose has kind right. of a similar situation with a seventh round pick that didn't get a lot of opportunities, um, but Samori Ture is the only guy that's really played and shown anything up to this point. All right, all right. Now uh, the thing I, I've got to ask you about on this offensive line um, is you've got two spots that you believe uh, we talked about this on the other video that you believe are going to be uh, open at some point. And it could be this year. It could be next year, but that's center and right guard. So I know it's only been a f- couple of years uh, for Ryan, uh, but you, you think that the organization already knows what they have in him at this point. I know that he hasn't shown that he's a capable starter. Um, if he happens to show up this year and is a really good football player, then great. But there is no information that this team has based on what he did last year that would make them feel comfortable in not addressing the position. So um, he he came in, I mean, his first year, he couldn't even get on like the third team in training camp. It was brutal okay. for, for Sean Ryan. And that was shocking because, you know, again, he's a third round pick and you would expect something better from him. Um then this past year, he got a little bit of playing time, but it was, I mean, it was so wildly up and down, you know, I mean, from a you know PFF standpoint, it would go from like an 80 pass blocking to a 20. And it was okay. just like, it, it was, it was rough. So um, I, I would just assume again, it's possible he could show up and, and be a great guard, but they don't know that if he is. Yeah. All right. And then Myers, do you think the, the, the ship has so, sailed? Myers was was actually quite solid for several years. Last year, something I don't know what happened. Him and John Runyon uh, this last year just fell off a cliff. I thought both of them were fine. Neither of them were good run blockers, but from a pass blocking standpoint, they both were were fine. And then last year, it just went off a cliff. They let Runyon go. Um, Myers, I mean, unless he can correct it, I have to assume it's going to be one and done for him. I mean, he's never going to be a good run blocker, but if he at least can get back to being a good pass blocker, maybe he can save his job. But um, I, 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 if I had to guess, he won't be here next year. So you, and, and, and Walker, uh, again, another seventh round draft pick, but Walker's a guy that you believe will, that will start off. Do you think he'll start off as this, as the left tackle week one? And then they just hope, even if they add another lineman here or there, they'll just hope that he's going to be the guy this year. Uh, do you think that's, that's the plan is to give him one year uh, at least week one as the man yeah i think i think what the packers will want to do is i think they're going to go pretty offensive line heavy and then they'll come into training camp and and essentially say it's an open competition and we'll see how it goes i expect rasheed walker to be the starting left tackle i think even if they get a tackle like i had mentioned in our our last video they really like zach tom inside so if they feel they have a really good tackle i'm 
I'm wondering if they would try to force him to right side and leave Rashid at left tackle. So the path to Rashid not playing tackle seems uh, unlikely to me at this point. Okay, so what would be fair to say then is with all the picks they have, you could see the Packers adding uh, three players, three offensive linemen for each position, center, guard, tackle as competition. Yeah, or or you know, they, they, again, they like or to get guys, guys. Th- flexible guys. Yeah, they'll get three offensive linemen, maybe some guys that have interior experience. Some of them, you know, guard, tackle, whatever. But yeah, I I think probably at least three. Uh, they've done three in the past, and they they like to really hammer a position. And it just feels like at the even with from a depth standpoint, it's pretty rough on the offensive line. I think they're they're probably if I had to pick a position, they were going to get three or more. I would go offensive line. Yeah, because uh, this is going to be – they're going to be a ton of linemen. They're going to be drafted in the first There's a lot. Round this year. Yeah, exactly. And so everybody's strategy going in this year is – or mostly everybody's strategy is going to be, well, we got to get the offensive linemen first. Right. And then we'll take care of it. But some general manager might go, well, they're all doing that. Oh, look, yeah. look, look who's here now. <laughs> exactly. Everyone else will fall. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to go get that guy. So anyway, that's what's so fun about the draft. Okay, so uh, as we close out uh, – Special teams was pretty bad last year. Mm-hmm. Um, but do they, first of all, do they still like the the Irish punter? I know statistically he didn't look good, but are they still banking on him uh, to be their guide and are willing to give him another year, or are they definitely bring in competition for him? Um, I think competition is likely. I think they like him, but they also like to bring in guys just to see what happens. Um so I, I wouldn't be shocked if there was another punter in there, but I, I think they overall kind of liked Daniel Whelan, if I had How to about guess. You? I mean, I, I've seen terrible punters, and I know how bad it can get. So I, I think if you just set a floor, which he does, I think it's fine. I, I don't okay. have a problem with him. Andres Carlson is the one that scares me more than than Daniel Whelan does. Yeah, there was a lot of that going around. Yeah. And uh, Carlson uh, had his uh, ups and downs. Uh, uh so they bring in Joseph. And so now you've got a competition. Yep. And what do you think? How do you think it's going to go? If I had to guess, Anders Carlson's going to win. Uh, they did this a lot with Mason Crosby. He would go through a slump. They would always bring in competition and they would kind of put their <laughs> finger on the scale a little bit. You know, somebody would, somebody would edge out and like, oh, I think they were better than Mason. Nah, nah, Mason won. Okay. So they, <laughs> I mean, they, they drafted him. Uh, they believe in him. Their their special teamer, uh, their special teams coach. You know, worked with his brother, and and actually has worked with Anders Carlson as well when he was younger, and he knows him. So, um, I, they're a very patient organization, and they they weather the storm more than just about anybody else. So I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna stick with him unless it's just a disaster. If Anders Carlson goes out there and he's shanking everything, and you've got a guy, and it's like we 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 can't we can't put this guy out there. You know, we're, we're talking playoffs at this point. We can't risk losing NFC championship because yeah. this guy can't kick extra points, you know? That's right. That's the thing. Because yeah. you hit it on the head. This is a team with Super Bowl aspirations now. So right. that's going to be important. Just look at San Francisco. Now, it looked like it worked out at the end. Moody, right. sure, made some big kicks in the Super Bowl. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's you know it's, it's a major risk. Okay, so uh, the, the return game. So we know Nixon – is as good as there is as a kick returner. Uh, uh, punt return situation, are they okay there? Do they need to have someone to compete or replace Reed? I think I think Reed's pretty solid. I'm, I'll be interested to see what uh, with the new kickoff return rules, um, whether Keyshawn's still really good at that or not. It's kind of a new play now. So I'm hoping he can still do it, but uh, I'm wondering if there's going to be a new batch of kick return specialists that aren't maybe what the old kick return specialists were. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. You know, I mean, my guess is, is I think if you were really good at it before, I think you're, you're, you're still going to be, a. I think you might even be a bigger part of it now. So, Oh yeah, uh, definitely. It's definitely more important of a play for sure. Yeah. And, the, but strategy wise, that's the thing that, yeah, we're all going to be kind of lost on that one. Okay. So, uh, that's going to wrap it up. Uh, Give me your best guess. Give me a prediction. Packers, if they do not move out of that spot. And by the way, what? how's the uh, draft day history uh, for Gooden Goose when it comes to trading? So he actually is uh, 
he's got a pretty decent track record of moving up. Um, I know he moved up for Jair. He moved up for Jordan Love. Um, I feel like there was something maybe involved with Savage, but I can't remember. There, so there's 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 movement in the first round for sure. Um, obviously, he likes to move back and accumulate picks. But, you know, again, with with um, the way the everything is lining up, where you kind of, you like 25, but you really like 20, you know, and the guys that are available there probably, and the fact that they have the extra capital, you got the two-thirds and all that. I wouldn't be surprised if they can find a partner if they're kind of looking to get to that 20 range because now you're, you know, depending on who falls, I mean, we talked about even Edge, you know, what if what if a guy like Latu falls or, you know, what if a, a guy like Fashanu starts to get down to 17, 18? It's hard to not pull the trigger on a guy like that on top of all the corners and, and whatnot. So um, we'll see what happens, but I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that does happen. Otherwise, I think last year he traded down in the second round twice in a row and accumulated a bunch of picks. So, you know, it's one of those, if you get to 25 and you're not a super big fan of, of what's available, screw it. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Let somebody come up for Bo Nix. Let's go into the second round. Okay. So uh, if, if he trades up, what position do you think that would be for? I would guess corner. Okay. And, That'd be my guess. And if he stays where he is and he doesn't, and, and, and the Packers make the pick where they are, give me a prediction. Who's that player going to be? So, I mean, corner's tough because we're kind of getting to that. I don't know if they make it range. Like Kool-Aid and Cooper, that's kind of a kind of a reach. So assuming they don't, we're kind of getting into offensive line makes more sense. Okay. Um, when you're so looking at Graham line, Barton, Tyler Guyton, you know, there's some options there. I still feel like corner would be the best option, but if if they kind of run out, um, that's kind of the range I'm looking at. You could also say Jackson Powers Johnson. Uh, I don't know. For me, it doesn't feel right, but, I mean, obviously the Packers could feel differently. So a uh, lot of offensive line. Jordan Morgan makes a lot of sense right there. Okay. That's good. Yeah, offensive line does make a lot of sense because, again, it's going to go – Early and plentiful, and if the Packers have those several needs up front, you would think that uh, they're going to try to take care of that as soon as possible. So, yep. um, all right, well, excellent, uh, Ryan. I appreciate it uh, again. The Packernet podcast, you can check that out both on uh, streaming services like as you said, iTunes. You could check it out on YouTube as well. We'll have links in the description for both. That'll make it easy for everybody out there that's watching this uh, broadcast that you can go ahead and check out Ryan uh, and uh, follow the Packers accordingly. So again, Ryan, uh, thanks for doing this, and I hope we get the opportunity to talk again. I look forward to it. Hopefully after the draft sometime we'll have some good news. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, right. Ryan. Yeah.